Okay, so uh, we are about to move into the next kind of big piece of physics, uh, and that's doing two-dimensional kinematics. In the last chapter, we did uh, we did one-dimensional kinematics. So you had questions on the homework that were things like, you know, a, a car moves along a road at a certain velocity and then accelerates a little bit and then stops for a certain amount of time, et cetera, et cetera. And you want to find total displacement or something like that. Um, so everything we did there was one dimensional. What we're going to get into now uh, is, I think, a lot more interesting. Uh, we're going to talk about two dimensions. So we're going to talk about, for example, uh, the, the typical example we're going to do is the cannonball problem where imagine a cannon that has some angle above the ground. So it's not, it's not aiming completely horizontally across the ground. It's aiming at some angle, you know, 30, 45 degrees or something. And we want to be able to calculate the uh, maximum elevation of the cannonball, how far it goes, and that kind of thing. But you can see pretty quickly there that that is non-trivial because you're moving in both the X and the Y direction simultaneously. Whereas everything we've done in one dimension, we've just picked one direction, the X direction or the Y direction or whatever, and, and done everything there. Now we're going to do two. In order to do two dimensions, though, uh, we are really going to have to have a good grasp on trigonometry. Uh, I know that you guys have all seen trig at some point. It might have been a while for some of you, and when you did see it, you might not have completely understood it. And so I think before I start really digging into any kind of complex problems with two-dimensional uh, kinematics, it's a good idea to go and review the basics of trig because you're going to need a lot of this. Um, I didn't make these slides. I acquired them online somewhere, but I'll still post them on our Blackboard. So, so here we go. Uh, triangles are really the whole point of trigonometry, hence the prefix tri. And so really this is just about taking your regular two-dimensional space you're used to thinking about and splitting it. So we have this kind of diagonal. So really this square can be expressed as two different triangles. So you, if you do this, if you split a square, right, now we're going to assume this is a square that all sides are equal. If you do that, then you get an isosceles right triangle uh, where your smaller angles are both 45 and you have your 90 degree there, uh, the turn. Remembering that with all triangles, the internal angles always add up to 180 degrees. Uh, if we do the same thing with this kind of equilateral triangle, so here we have a triangle, but we're going to split it in half. Well, then we get a different kind of triangle. Uh, and the internal angles are 30, 60, and 90. Again, we have our 90 degree. Notice that in both of these triangle forms, the key is that we have a 90 degree angle. Now, if the sides are equal, you end up with these equal angles, this 45, 45. If they're not, you end up with something different in this case of 30, 60, 90. So what we want is to find a way that we can express these lengths of these different sides mathematically, because this is really what we're going to do in physics. And I'll show you some examples later on. So if we say that the sides of the square are of some length x, we can use Staggerian theorem c squared equals a squared plus b squared, where a and b would be the sides of the uh, square and C would be 
this long side called the hypotenuse of the triangle. And if you work that central algebra, you find out that the hypotenuse is always x times square root of 2 in length, assuming these are both x. If you do the same thing with uh, this kind of triangle, if we assume that the short side on the bottom is x length, and the long side is 2x in length, in other words, two times as long, then what you'll find if you do, again, the Thagoras uh, equation, that the long side, the hypotenuse here, uh, actually, it wouldn't be the hypotenuse, would it? this would be the hypotenuse, uh, you would get this side of x times root 3. There's a couple of examples in here. I'm not going to walk through all of them. Uh, but again, they will be these slides will be up uh, on Blackboard, and you can play with these examples as you need to. This is really what I'm getting at, though, is this idea of these trig functions. So the trig functions, let's see if I figure out how to go back. So the trig functions are what we're going to use quite a bit because what we're going to do is I'll give you a problem. For example, one of the problems we're going to do is we're going to push a box up a hill. So you're going to get something that looks like this right triangle or some ramp. And I'm going to give you some angle here. And eventually what we're going to have to figure out is how much force we need to apply to push that box up the hill. And so if you stop thinking about triangles, if you stop thinking about these being sides, think about them being the vector, okay? The velocity vector, the acceleration vector, whatever it is that we're looking at. And then you can see that we can use the idea that these vectors come together to look like triangles to solve for the other piece that we need. And the way we're going to do that is with our standard trig functions. All standard trig functions do is it gives you a ratio. For example, the sine function gives you the ratio of the opposite leg to the hypotenuse. Remember, the hypotenuse is always the longest leg of the triangle. It's always directly across from the 90 degree angle. If we'll look. Let's just take this seven, seven, seven root two triangle. Here's your right angle. So this is going to be your hypotenuse because it's a, always directly across from the right angle. The hypotenuse is always going to be the longest side of the triangle. But when we start talking about this opposite and adjacent thing, we're not talking about opposite of the right triangle and or the right angle anymore. We're talking about opposite and adjacent to some angle we want to measure. So if we look at this 60 degree angle here, the adjacent side to this triangle. Now there are two sides of the triangle that are adjacent to the 60 degrees. However, we already know that this side labeled C is the hypotenuse, so it can't be that one. So it has to be the one that's right next to the angle. In this case would be this seven unit uh, leg. The opposite side is exactly what you think. It's the side that's opposite of the angle, in this case, side B. Similarly, the cosine is the ratio of the adjacent over hypotenuse, and the tangent is the ratio of the opposite over the adjacent. There's a mnemonic that we have taught for generations to remember which ones of these are which, and it's the Sokotoa thing. There are a bunch of different ways you can remember this. Uh, one of the ones I like is some old hippie caught another hippie tripping on acid. Uh, whatever helps you understand this and remember that, that's fine. Uh, also, it's perfectly fair on homeworks or a test to go, I don't remember which one of those is which, and just look it up. 
Uh, sometimes I get confused about what they are. So here's how we're going to use that. So if we wanted to find out uh, this angle here, notice I'm missing something. I've got sine, cosine, tangent, and I've got all these legs. There is an implied theta here after the sine, cosine, and tangent. So it's actually the sine, sine times the angle equals this ratio. So if we're trying to find an angle, which is what we're going to do a lot of times, we're going to need this. So we have to figure out which angle we want to define. So in this case, this x. And we're given that one side of the triangle is 11 and a half units, and the hypotenuse is 24.2 units. In this case, they're saying it's feet. So we need an equation for to solve for this angle that uses the hypotenuse and the opposite side of the triangle. Well, we know that sine uses opposite hypotenuse, right? If we tried to use cosine, we couldn't do it because we don't know what the adjacent leg looks like. And for the same reason, we can't use tangent. So like I was talking about the other day, if we write down what we know using our checklist, we write down the things we know. If we write down opposite leg is 11.5, hypotenuse is 24.2, and then we start writing down trig functions, we'll find easily that, oh, well, there's only one I can use. Remember, there's an implied theta here. So sine theta equals opposite over hypotenuse, opposite is 11 and a half, uh, hypotenuse 24.2. So you get the sine of x or theta or whatever you like for the angle is this ratio. Remember what we're after though is the x, so you can't just leave it in this form. So you have to do uh, the inverse sine in order to get rid of this. Remember, every algebraic function has an inverse function. So on your calculator, you've typically got something that says sine to the minus one. Uh, that's called the inverse sine. And so if you get that ratio, take the inverse sine of it, you're solving for x, and you'll come out with something that looks like 28.4 degrees. Remember when you do this, Pay attention to if your calculator is in degrees or radians. Uh, if you're in radians, you're going to get a weird number here. You can generally look at these kind of problems and get a feel for what this theta should be. In this case, if you calculated this in radians mode, you're going to get something that looks like 0 0.0003 or something. Well, clearly that's not a less than one degree angle there. So it doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, we also know that the internal angles of the triangle end up being 180. So if this is already 90 here, then this means these two have to add up to 90. And so I can kind of guess already that this looks like about 30 degrees and this looks like the rest of it. There are uh, a way that you can quantify these things if you don't want to do the inverse sine, inverse cosine, whatever it is. If you flip the ratios, for example, one over sine is the hypotenuse over the opposite. But if we look, sine is opposite over hypotenuse. So if you take the inverse of that, the inverse sine. This is also something called the cosecant. You don't really use these too much, but sometimes it can be useful uh, for finding things in, in very special cases. I don't recall any homework assignments or any problems that I've given you that use these functions, but I want you to know what they are and where they come from. So it's just a matter of which one of these is the numerator and which one is the denominator in this ratio, and it'll give you one of these functions. But again, the ones we're really worried about, sine, cosine, and tangent. So let's talk about radians. I mentioned that a minute ago. Uh, remember, a radian is 
the ratio of the arc length over the radius of the circle. So the reason we like to use radians uh, is that they are a non-ambiguous uh, measurement. If you look at degrees, for example, let me go back here and look at one of those triangles. So we have this triangle with an angle of 28.4 degrees. Well, if we measured that angle between this part of the triangle and this part of the triangle, and we measured that distance, you would get some value, right? But if you went and measured from here to here, you measured that arc, you'd get a different value. Now it's still the same degree of angle, but the arc length itself is gonna be much, much different. So we need a way to express these angles that don't rely on how far away you are from the apex of that triangle. So we use radians. And the way we use radians is that we have to define for any circle, we know that it's two pi radians to go all the way around the circle. So this, you can research this on your own if you care. This pi function is the ratio of the radius to the circumference of the circle. It's always pi, or that 3.14159 number that's infinitely repeating. Uh, but we know that every circle behaves the same way. So how do we convert? Well, the conversion is easy. You take your angle in degrees and you multiply it by pi over 180. Again, you can go prove that zero to yourself if you like. I'm not gonna expect you off the top of your head to know that, um, but if you ever do encounter that, you may need to look it up. But notice if we had an angle that was supposed to be 57 degrees and I didn't change my calculator to degree mode, you're gonna come out with an answer that looks like 0.994. Now, like I said, it's kind of ambiguous what that angle looks like, but I think we could all pretty much eyeball something and say if it's closer to 0.9 degrees or 57 degrees. So be aware of that whenever you put numbers in your calculator, if you start getting very, very strange numbers like this in trig functions, you're probably in radiance mode. Just again, some examples that I will leave to you to do on your own. So what in the hell does this have to do with triangles? Well, if you take a look at this circle here, if we start by saying, well, there's two pi radians in every trip around the circle, then we can start to measure these angles between uh, these different points. So if we take this blue angle, that's 90 degrees, obviously, right? Because if we look this line to this line, there's 90 degrees. Well, that ends up being pi over two. Well, remember it's two pi to go all the way around the circle. So if we start here and we go all around, that's two pi. Half of that, well, two pi over two is just pi. So half of that's out here. And then pi over two is this line. So there's your 90 degree angle, it's pi over two. The green one should be what, pi? And the purple one, well, that should be two pi, right? Oh, it's talking about this purple one, sorry. Um, so that should be three pi over two. And then the last angle, which is coming all the way back around the circle is two pi. Well, look what you can do if you now take these different angles and radians, you can easily draw triangles with them. Again, I don't care too much about that. This is review. This is what I wanted. So what we find 
is if we do a little investigation of this, if we pick some point on the circle, now notice that point has to be at one of the apexes of the triangle, and we call that point x, y. If we notice that the y length of the y position is just the y axis and the x position is the x axis, and we know this is a right triangle, right? Because we just built this. And we go back and we remember what our trig functions tell us about these ratios. Then we'll take this angle, we'll call it A. And we find that the sine of that angle is y over 1, right? Because sine is the opposite over the hypotenuse, or y over 1. So the sine of A is just y. Similarly, the cosine of a is x over 1, which is just x, and the tangent of a is y over x. And so there's just some simple examples you can do. And what this gives you, these values of 1 half minus 3 halves and such, give you what's called the unit circle. This is really useful. And you can go find a copy of this online anywhere you want. I recommend printing one off uh, because you're going to find a lot of times the values you're going to come up with when we're doing a bunch of physics problems is you're going to end up with values that look like root 2 over 2. And instead of having to build the unit circle every time, if you just remember how this works, uh, again, Start with 2 pi, split it in half. That's pi. Split that in half again is 2 pi. Well, halfway between pi and pi over 2 is 3 pi over 4. Halfway between 3 pi over 4 and pi over 2 gives you 2 pi over 3, and so on. And then we can do those ratios, if you like, to get all your coordinates. And here's just a bunch more examples. So if you go to graph these things, then here's what you end up with. Uh, your cosine and your sine functions are going to end up looking very similar, except that they're offset by 180 degrees. So your sine function is going to pass through 0 here at the origin, and at the origin, your Cosine function is going to go up here at 1. This is what your tangent function looks like, your cotangents, all this kind of thing. So we can do some things here uh, with conversions and graphing. Again, not really a big deal. Again, just review. Care about that. Don't care about that. It's just showing you how the functions work. This is not a math class. If you care, go back and read through this. So there's how we figure Pythagoras. Again, a lot of this is just the pure mathematics of how trig works. So let me see if I can find an example. <laughs> Not that one. Six, pretend I'm 
motion. There we go. Back here. This share. So this is the kind of thing that we're going to start to talk about with projectile motion. So here's our cannon. Now, what we've been doing in one dimensional kinematics is firing this cannon either where the ball doesn't change trajectory, it just continues straight forward, or it just goes straight down. Well, that's not really what happens. What really happens is that we have gravity that's going to pull this cannonball down towards the ground. Uh, another example, we might have somebody kicks a soccer ball at an angle of theta, and we need to know its displacement and its distance along the x and the y trajectory. So we can find that. And if you look, these equations here should look really similar to you, because this is what I talked about uh, last week. Remember, I also talked about a time-independent function, and that's what it is right there. Again, you can work that out on your own by just doing some substitutions. So let's see. Here's a good displacement one. So for example, the displacement in this thing, D, remember displacement is just kind of the total distance of travel that looks like a trig function, right? Well, we know a theta, and we know an x and a y, and we need that. So we need the hypotenuse, we know a theta, and we know an opposite and an adjacent side. Well, that looks like tangent. So we can find out that the displacement is just the root of the square of both those sides. We find that the angle between the two is that inverse tangent of that ratio. Remember, because you got to say tangent of theta is equal to y over x in this case. So we need theta by itself. You do the inverse tangent. Well, what if it's velocity? Well, notice in this case, we were looking at displacement. What if I didn't tell you that was displacement? What if I told you that was velocity? the equation doesn't change. It's still just a function of the squares. Notice this notation though, V sub X and the V sub Y, this is the velocity in the X direction. V sub Y is the velocity in the Y direction. So you're gonna see that on test problems, on homework problems, you're gonna see that notation of find V sub X, find V sub Y. Same thing with theta. Uh, the interesting thing here is that if you have done the diagram correctly and you've set these numbers up right, uh, what you will find if you doesn't matter if you're using velocity for this or distance for this, that theta has to be the same. And so you can work that out for distances and velocities and your theta will work out the same. Here is one of the places that is going to trip you up on this. Look at this diagram. This looks complicated. It's not really that bad. So if we take the black dot to be the cannonball or the soccer ball, whatever's moving, we, we will start at the origin. Our angle between the velocity uh, in the vertical and the velocity in the horizontal is always going to be the same. So this thing is not changing its arc at all. It's just going to do whatever arc we send it on. So that theta is always going to be the same. But if we take the blue line to be our velocity in the x direction and the orange line to be our velocity in the y direction, notice what happens. As the ball travels along our displacement vector, the displacement vector, the purple line, starts to change direction. This is our kind of going up and then coming back down. Remember we did the example in class the other day. If you take a ball and you throw it straight in the air, 
it's under the acceleration of gravity, it's going to slow down. At some point, it's going to stop and it's going to reverse direction. We can see that with the velocity vector in the y direction here. We start with a pretty high velocity vector in the y, but notice it gets shorter and shorter. And when we get to the top of the arc, there is no velocity in the y direction. So the y direction velocity there is zero, which is why we could do that trick. And then we start coming down. Notice we're falling faster and faster and faster. So if you looked at the change in those two velocities over time, that gives you acceleration, right? Because that's the definition of acceleration, is change of velocity over time. So if we look at this change in velocity and this change in velocity and these two times, you get the acceleration between here and here. If this is an Earth-like system uh, and we're not accounting for air resistance training, what you're going to find is that those ratios are always going to end up being 9.81. If you like, and sometimes it's far easier, instead of representing this motion with this whole arc, represent this motion with just one piece of it. Because now notice this is arbitrary, Vx and Vy, it doesn't really matter where we're at from this thing. The only thing that matters is direction again. So if we're traveling down, then V sub Y is in the negative direction because that's the direction we chose to be negative. You could absolutely choose V sub Y in this case to be the positive direction if you wanted to. In fact, that makes a lot of just the gravity problems that we have in homework two way, way easier if you just assume the positive direction is down. Remember, all the Stein does for you in physics is indicate direction. So here's a typical cannonball problem. Again, we're going to dig into these deeper uh, later in the week, and I'm going to do a lot more examples of these. But for today, my point is just review the trigonometry and get you to understand how to use trig. Basically, you just build up a whole bunch of triangles as you need, and you start working your sine, cosine, and tangent functions. Another projectile problem, a volcano shoots a cannonball or a piece of rock out at 25 meters per second at a 35 degree angle. And we want to know the angle it impacts the ground and how far away it went if the top of the volcano is 20 meters above the ground. So we can do all that. Again, I'll walk you through examples like this uh, later on in class. But for today, I just wanted you to see that. All right. Uh, so I think that is probably enough of that for today. Uh, does anybody have any questions on trig? I know that was fast, but it was supposed to be a review. So does anybody have any questions about this trigonometry review that I can answer for you real quick? No. OK, then. Um, then that's where I will stop today. So go stay out of the cold and the ice. And I would recommend you get to work if you have not done so already. Start on homework two that's due on Saturday. And as soon as you can, I would start on homework three, which starts to do this kind of stuff so that you have plenty of time to ask me questions because you're probably going to need to on this chapter. Okay. So I will see you guys again in the next lecture. Thank you. Uh,